Hello, uh, Paul Beck with again. So I've got two umbrellas, or if you're from the UK, brawlies. One of them is the money one. And notice the money one is on top of the earth one. Okay, this is what our priority is. This is the priority of many people in today's society. It's a priority of companies. It's a priority of governments. It's sort of the bottom line. You know, it's a way for power in our society. But this has come to dominate everything in our society. And uh, it's dominating nature. It's dominating, you know, to have clear blue skies, to have lush vegetation, to have enough water and food for survival, not just of humans, but of all plants and animals on the planet. We need a healthy uh, ecosystem. But unfortunately, the theme of money and the domination of everything with money has taken over and we're completely destroying this part. So the idea of climate restoration is to restore our climate system, our ecosystem, basically to, to health, to, uh, you know, why should our kids and grandkids, why should they have a dystopian world which they which they inherit from us. Why can't we do climate restoration and ensure that they have a, that they enjoy a planet that we enjoyed when we were kids and that our grandparents enjoyed when they were kids. So I'm just gonna finish up my discussion and you can Google this document, Climate Restoration, Solutions to the Greatest Threat Facing Humanity and Nature Today. And I'll go back to where I left off from the previous video. Um, so there's all of these just different techniques that I was talking about. And where were we? Yeah, so getting back here. So uh, often iron is a limiting nutrient in the ocean. With enough iron, you can get phytoplankton blooms, and then you can get zooplankton and go all the way up the um, trophic food chain in the ocean and get, uh, you know, the oceans basically teeming with fish again. Now, large volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo in 1991 not only reduced CO2 levels for about a year by scattering nutrients, okay, far and wide from the ash, they reflect solar radiation and thereby decrease average temperatures of the planet, okay, depending on um, the size of the volcano and depending on how much of the ash and sulfur dioxide got up into the stratosphere. That affects the climate. Um, smaller volcanoes don't have any effect on the climate if they don't inject any sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere. Okay, so iron is a limiting nutrient in many areas. Um, in ocean iron fertilization demonstrations, sprinkling a tiny amount of that mineral in an area of water, it blooms with phytoplankton, fish, and other flora and fauna. Okay, the ideal, ideal setting for OIF is discrete ocean pastures about 60 miles or 100 kilometers in diameter located with ocean, within ocean gyres. Circling currents keep the iron in place for several months as opposed to days, like in much of the open ocean, so the plankton grows and the fish feast. After the iron dissipates, the pasture reverts from green back to ocean desert blue, which is devoid of phytoplankton. If we did it in swirling gyres, it would reduce the need to reapply the iron frequently to remain optimum levels. So just as successful farmers use the minimum amount of fertilizer and fallow their land, OIF pastures receive the minimum intervention or are left fallow most of the time. It only takes about 10 pounds of iron ore dust per square mile to create phytoplankton blooms. Now, if you compare this to farmers, they dust 90,000 pounds of fertilizer on one square mile of coin, corn, for example. That's 9,000 times more fertilizer. That's 90,000 pounds versus 10 pounds. Okay, so you just need to sprinkle, uh, you know, we have no problem about putting 90,000 pounds of fertilizer on, a, on fields, you know, on one square mile of corn. You know, 10 pounds in the ocean would, would uh, you know, have compatible, you know, uh, would have blooms of phytoplankton, okay? Um, so this is a key thing to, to do. And uh, okay, what else do we have here? You know, there's more and more interest in it, small island states, etc. You know, it is a controversial thing. 
right? And there's, you know, many climate specialists misunderstand how it's practiced. They express fear that it would affect most of the ocean, but it's one or two percent of the oceans. Um, and, um, you know, people talk about it causing dead zones, low areas, but this, is in, this would be in shallow water. You would do this in the deep ocean, and that's not going to happen in the deep ocean. Um, and, and so on, okay? So there's also direct air capture. Um, there's alkal alkalinization, you know, there's um, agriculture, forestry, and improved land use. There's all these other different ideas, ocean downwelling, okay? So those are all ideas to remove large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere. But we have a problem here. Houston, we have a problem. We have the Arctic losing sea ice and snow cover at ever greater rates. We have thus a darkening Arctic, absorbing solar radiation, heating up like crazy, causing Arctic temperature amplification, causing feedbacks to further reduce sea ice and snow cover, further darken the Arctic. So refreezing the Arctic may be essential to ensuring long-term survival of humanity, along with pulling CO2 out of the air. Okay, um, and the reason, you know, if we lose the coldness, the refrigerator of the Arctic, then sea level, rise, sea level will rapidly rise from Greenland melt rate. We have problems with methane coming up, etc. So, so uh, you know, how do we accelerate the transition to, to a colder Arctic again? Okay, the threats of a melting Arctic are well documented. Um, Restoring the climate requires both restoring CO2 levels back and accelerating the transition back to the ice house state by rebuilding the polar ice caps. Okay, so one of the interesting ideas is using reflective sand in the Arctic. Reflective sand made from hollow microspheres of silica, a material abundant in the ocean. When sprayed over ice, the silica sand reflects sunlight, slowing the ice melt. And this has been done in demonstrations by a nonprofit company, Ice 911 Research. It treated, the treated ice lasted several weeks longer into spring than untreated ice. When the weather warms and melting begins, the silica floats, remaining reflective like ice itself. So you have these microspheres, about 50 microns in diameter. Okay, anything larger than 10 microns is considered safe. A micron, a micron is a millionth of a meter or a thousand microns is a millimeter. This material is safe to animals. It's chemically basically the same as sand. As sand. So it's like you're putting sand in the Arctic. A layer a third of a millimeter thick is covering large areas is enough to reflect uh, large amounts of sunlight. So strategic use of reflective sand could also cool the Siberian continental shelf where the permafrost is stored in the seafloor sea sediment. Um, okay, so marine cloud brightening is brightening clouds so they reflect sunlight using uh, nozzles to uh, atomize seawater and the salt crystals are of a certain of the size to cause uh, nucleation of, of water vapor into cloud droplets which are then highly reflective. Iron salt aerosol, and I'll do videos about all of these things separately over time, but iron salt aerosol is basically you add small amounts of iron to ship or power plant fuel. The iron salts that you generate are sent into the sky where they have many positive effects. So in the atmosphere, iron salt aerosols, they can eliminate, they react with methane. The iron salt aerosol catalyzes methane into CO2 and water. They increase the cloud brightness. They create cloud condensation nuclei for marine cloud brightening. And the iron gets into the ocean and, and uh, fertilizes the ocean, which removes huge amounts of CO2. Okay, so that's another, and sea ice thickening um, is another idea. So I'll have a look at the nanobubbles on the surface of the ocean, highly reflective. Okay, so the idea of climate restoration is to do three phases. Agree on the goal, organize the funding, declare a decade of climate restoration, and forge a climate restoration coalition. Then we do the climate restoration over the decade. We select, pilot, implement, and scale solutions to 100% needed capacity. And then we rapidly remove CO2 and restore Arctic ice as CO2 returns to below 300 ppm and the climate returns to health. 
Okay, so we're talking about restoring the climate. Now I'll go to this image, this table here, table two. So this is the uh, intervention, if you like, or the climate restoration idea. Again, I don't like the word solution so much for these, but carbon negative building materials. So it mimics, th these are all biomimicry or geomimicry processes that mimic things that actually happen in nature. So carbon negative building materials, we're mimicking how shellfish build shells from carbon dioxide and calcium. Public fin financing is not required because the material that you sell, you, the material you develop, the aggregate you would sell, it would replace quarried stone, which costs 30 to $200 a ton. And at capacity, it could cost $50 a ton. So, it's, so basically you remove the idea to quarry stone and you build the stone up from CO2 captured from the atmosphere. Investment per year for 10 years, 250 billion a year to build capacity to 5 billion tons a year. Um, IRR, 15%, internal rate of return. The estimate is from Blue Planet Limited. Check out their website. Um, ocean fertilization. Basically, it mimics volcanic dust fertilizing the ocean. 20 million a year to monitor it, to oversee it. 300 million a year to deploy it. Um, and you generate these pastures. And these pastures, they remove huge amounts of CO2 and it pays for itself because they cause a plethora of fish and you basically use that fish to uh, feed, the, feed, feed the growing world population and give coastal economies uh, a big boost. Combined with ocean fertilization, you use permaculture arrays with upwelling, so kelp forests near natural upwelling sites. And basically, you, so you build these arrays to cover a million square kilometers per year for 10 years. Um, and basically, uh, you know, those are, those are some of the key things that can be done. Now, for Arctic ice restoration, uh, you have ice thickening, and this is done a lot in the north already. For example, to, if you know, for ice roads in northern Canada, you just pump seawater from on top of the ice and it freezes. And you thicken the ice, you build up the ice overall, and you can use wind power, wind generators to do that. Okay, so that's for sea ice restoration only. Floating sand, which you cover on the ice, and uh, maybe glaciers to cause the reflectivity be, to be higher, to reflect away sunlight, keeping it colder in the Arctic. Marine cloud brightening um, to generate low-level marine clouds to uh, reflect sunlight to cool the ocean surfaces. The iron salt aerosols, multi-pronged, okay? One thing is to destroy methane. Another thing is the iron fertilizes the ocean. And the third thing is that the aerosols create the low-level clouds. Stratospheric aerosol in injection is to put the sulfur dioxide up into the atmosphere to simulate the volcano. That can be used to cool the tropics and improve crops and save lives. Nanobubbles on the surface. Okay, so those are all of the different uh, techniques. And, you know, you can go on and, and read the rest of the uh, document, but I, uh, basically, you know, the objective is, you know, sa save the humans. It's not about save the whales. It's not about, you know, it's about, it's ensuring that we have a viable planet to live on um, for our children and going forward. And there's lots of, uh, you know, different information here on tipping points and, you know, other things like that. There's a whole list of references. And, uh, you know, so basically, um, so basically climate restoration is, is going to be a key thing moving forward. And I'll break up, this video is sort of a broad overview of all of the things. I'll be talking about some more of these things in, in Madrid. This is the website for ICE 911. You can have a look at it. This is the Blue Planet, Blue Planet website. This is another website on creating a resilient path, Minerva Ventures. And again, go to my website and please support my work via PayPal or go to my GoFundMe and you can support my, my uh, conference stuff. And I'll be doing lots and lots of videos from the conference. I'm involved in lots of uh, talks and things, press conferences, and I'll be meeting Peter Fiakowski. Um, James Hansen is gonna be there. Um, I'll be, you know, perhaps Tom Steyer, Greta is gonna be there. So you'll see me appear in lots of different things and I'll 
do lots of videos throughout the conference. Thanks for listening.